When we started out preparing for this conference, uh, uh, Willie Rutten and I had some brainstorming. We had many brainstorming sessions, actually. And one of the ideas we came up with was a session that basically would be not really about financial journalism, but that would be very interesting to financial journalists. So that is basically what this session is, uh, is uh, coming out on. It's called The New Paradigm of Money. And I just want to read you the carefully drafted paragraph that we, uh, that we came up with in outlining this session, basically to set the context. In the old days, money was seen as an intelligent, fast, and efficient way of matching supply and demand. That no longer seems to be the case. Has money become a business on all of its own? Is it too virtual to understand and to regulate? Has money become a business that feeds on itself? Or is it just creating financial products that no longer cater to traditional production industries that leave manufacturing businesses starved for cash? We've seen the rise in parallel of social networks that are no longer money-based, that depend on network effects and on sharing knowledge, rather than on timing and appropriating phys physical objects. As the age of scarcity, where money was used to allocate resources, morphed into an age of abundance, where people share what they have. In a world where quarterly, quarterly growth in dollars and euros remains the basis for valuating stock markets and assessing the economy, can money still be relied on as a performance indicator? Will this crisis signal the end of the Anglo-Saxon model of money and markets? Are we in for a paradigm change in which quarterly growth at any price is no longer a viable model. Now, it's difficult to find speakers to, uh, to, to talk about that, but we're very pleased to have here uh, Bernard Littard, uh, basically a financial futurist. We like to describe you like that. And Bernard Littard has been at the roots of the euro. He worked in the 1980s at the Belgian Central Bank over here as one of the people who were behind the ECU projects, the European Currency Unit. And that was basically what led to the European uh, Monetary Union in the 1990s. I'd like a warm welcome for Bernard Litter, who is going to talk to us about monetary blind spots and structural solutions, and also on central banking. Thank you. Let me start off by saying that I enjoyed the morning so far, or today so far. I mean, I would like to initiate with a question. How many of you think that the worst of the crisis is behind us? Okay. How many of you think that the worst of the crisis is in front of us? Okay, I have a question, gentlemen. How come that the media tells the opposite? Today, the media worldwide talks about the opposite of what you unanimously agreed on. And you're not the only ones. I have asked this question to very different audiences. Mostly in Europe, but not exclusively in Europe. The answer that the majority had is people know that the media or why, instead of talking about the crisis that has passed, why don't we switch to the crisis that is coming, that nobody wants to talk about? That's what I would like to leave with after my intervention. Uh, I would also like to congratulate uh, this community. As far as I know, it is the only one that has asked the question of why we don't see. Politicians haven't done it. Financial circles certainly haven't done it. More surprisingly, and actually critically, in my view, the academics haven't done it. Everybody means standing up on their own little old platform. The reason, there's a big silence of why it isn't happening. So, at least, I mean, I'm very honored to be here for that very reason, because I believe it's the only circle that actually is doing that question. Um, there are three things I have not heard today. Uh, the first one is that nobody has questioned the paradigm of money. You've been talking about it. You've talked about the structural issues in the domain of 
the financial reporting, you have not talked about the structural issues of the domain on which you are reporting. What I hope to show you is that there is a structural issue in the monetary domain. And that is that structural issue that is actually the cause of this instability. And that therefore the solution for it, the structural solution, re requests us, re demands from us, that we actually become aware of that paradigm, of the blind spot. So, let me propose that if I say something that is not understood, you stop me immediately. I'm not trying, you know, if there's a clarification issue. I Usually money is used as a domain where complexity is used to hide reality, as Galbraith said. I hope to do the reverse, I'll do with you guys, you know, you're obviously in the soup. Okay, but let me establish that premise. Stop me if I use a word that is not understood. Because I'm going to get outside of the monetary domain and outside of the financial domain to explain what's happening in it. All right. The other thing I haven't heard of today is <laughs> this entire discussion has happened that this is the first crisis. Right? That's the only crisis, right? Well, there have been 97 previous banking crashes over the last 25 years, according to the accounting of the World Bank. And there have been 176 monetary crises over the last 25 years. Why is that not relevant? Why is it that somehow we treat this as if this is a special case? Let me give you a metaphor. I'm giving you a car. It doesn't have brakes and the steering wheel doesn't work well. And I send you to Italy from here. That means I go over the Alps. Right? So you're going to have an accident, right? And when you're going to have an accident, you say, what a bad driver. Mr. Greenspan didn't see it. Right? The bad driver. We need to replace the driver. Oh, and where is you? Oh, look at those maps you're using. They're maps from the 1990s or 1980s. She was no wonder. The curve was not on that map. So we need to reboot regulations. Sorry, nobody talks about the car. The car is our monetary banking system because it's the same thing. And nobody dares to talk about it. Academically, press, or of course the financial press, the financial circles, or the politicians. That is the paradigm. The paradigm we're living with is a monopoly of bank debt money. That is the thing that nobody questions. It's the only possible way. It has to be a monopoly, and it has to be bank debt money. All right. Where does that lead us? A monopoly of bank debt money. That whenever there's something funny with the banking system, the world stops. What the governments have learned in the 1930s is that you need to save the banking system, otherwise the entire economy goes bankrupt. Right. What we'll learn in this one is that we cannot afford to save the banking system. Now what? Now what? That's the issue. So, my claim is the monetary system is systemically unstable. It is as unstable as a car without a brake and a steering wheel that don't work. So all the rest is kind of decorating the issue, walking around it. Okay? We're now going to extract the car from the ravine where you put it in, oh, you bad driver. Okay? and we're going to refurbish the wheels, and off you go to your next crash. Right? Now, the reason that I can claim that it's systemically unstable is work that has been done for 25 years in a field that you're not familiar with. It's complexity theory, as applied to natural ecosystems. But let me explain why. First of all, let's deal with the blind spot. Why is it that we cannot see the money paradigm as being part of the discussion? That's what I call the blind spot. Then I'll talk about the systemic cause, which brings us to complexity theory and stability. And out of, once you understand, and out of, once you understand the systemic issue, then you can see automatically where the systemic solution lies. 
But if you don't visit there from that paradigm level, you'll never see it. You can't. So, and then I'll finish with my proposal. Okay? Because I have gotten the rule never to talk about the problem unless I have at least a, something, a bit of a solution. <laughs> All right? Now, Ruben said it nicely. No one saw it coming, right? Queen Elizabeth asked you, how come nobody saw it? No, nobody warned about this, right? Um, Greenspan says, oh well, gee whiz, unless you change human nature, we're going to have other crashes. They're all saying the same thing. Okay? We don't understand. Now, the monetary blind spot is an accumulation of four, four layers. That's why it is so difficult to go through it. The first one is history, old history, about 5,000 years of history, to be precise. And I'll explain that in a few minutes why. The second one is ideological polarization. We've gone through Cold War, which has polarized ideologically everything we talk about economics and social sciences. Okay? And it has an effect on what we can see. The third one is an academic taboo. It is not a good idea in a, an academic career to touch the money system, and I explain to you why. And finally, there's a lobbycracy. And the best lobbies are the ones that you don't know are lobbies. Okay? Fine. So that's what I'll show you. All of them accumulate, one over the other. So let's start with the beginning. If you put one box in which you put all patriarchal societies in history, China, sorry, did I say this? <laughs> all patriarchal societies in one box, okay? Can we kind of shut this off, please? Uh, can we cut this? Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, I obviously seem to be. Okay. Uh, you will have a, common of a few common denominators in all patriarchal societies, and I'll explain what they are. By the way, the best way to recognize what a patriarchal society is, the rule of thumb, look at what their vision of the divine is. If the vision of the divine is a man, all by himself, with a bear, sitting invisible in the sky, you're dealing with a patriarchal society. Okay? Fine. All patriarchal societies have a monopoly of a centralizing currency with positive interest rates. Okay? Which is a concentration device to the top. People who have resources get more resources. It is actually, I claim that it is that model that made the Industrial Revolution possible. No, but the Industrial Revolution hasn't occurred by someone starting a steel mill in his garage or starting, you know, my, with a train around this garden, you know. I mean, you need to have massive concentration of resources. And this is still true today, that little computer, the chip in there, that little chip costs a billion dollars to produce. You know, that's not something you have come as pocket money somewhere. Okay? So that's the first, that's a positive thing. On the other side, our current version of that money system has created the boom and bust cycles. They are directly related to the money system. Okay? The second thing that it has to do with concentrations of wealth. Right? And finally, unsustainable behavior, short-term thinking, is all part of that. The other civilizations that didn't do that didn't have that problem. Now, you'll say, <laughs> what is the other solution? It's matrifocal society. I'm using the word matrifocal, not matriarchal. Matriarchy has never existed. Matriarchy would be a society in which males have the role of procreation and no other. Okay? That only existed in the imagination of the Greeks, in the form of the Amazons, of which there has never been a society that they have been able to identify, archaeologically or otherwise. Matrifocal societies are so societies which honor feminine values. Okay? Fine. Uh, Egypt is a good example. We have one in our society in Western Europe, 
from the 10th to the 13th century, when courtly love was the story, when the women's rights were higher than 50 years ago, okay, where the standard of living of women was higher than... Where actually, the city of London has an interesting episode. Uh, you have a museum of the city of London. They have the bones of uh, people that they've unearthed from prehistoric times, and they made an analysis of the size of the people over time. Would you believe that the women were the tallest in the history of London in the 12th century? A centimeter taller than today? The male has only caught up with the Londoner male of the Saxon times in the last 30 years. That's a little different vision, isn't it? Anyway, matrifocal societies, guess what? They have another money system. No, it is not a monopoly of another time of currency. It is a dual currency system. Two types of money. One, which is identical to the patriarchal one, and actually very often the one of the patriarchal societies, literally. In the case of Egypt, they used gold rings. Used in Mesopotamia, they used uh, Greek coins. You find Greek coins in, uh, in, in Egypt. Um, that is to trade with people you don't know. Long distance trade. People you're indifferent with. And you have another currency, which is used locally, which people themselves are creating, which is done in sufficiency rather than in scarcity, and which has a completely different dynamic. They have a dual currency system. Okay? Now, one of the things that that did is it made it economic stability for centuries, and I'm meaning for centuries, in the case of Egypt, we're talking 1,600 years, not bad for a stable economy. Uh, the, uh, we did have uh, general well-being, the little people, the highest standard of living, as I said, in the Middle Ages, uh, in Europe, was in the Middle Ages. Rather funny, isn't it? For the ordinary people. And they had sustainability. They built stuff to last forever. If you don't believe it, go and look at the cathedrals. All the cathedrals were built in the time period where they had dual currency systems in Europe. Okay? So that's the first level. We have been used to think that a monopoly of centralizing currency is the only way of doing things, as in all eight other patriarchal societies. Second level, ideological polarization. For about 100 years, and certainly since World War II, since we were born, any one of us, I would say, we have been living with that polarization between communism and capitalism. Okay? And Communism is about public ownership, governmental initiatives, and central planning, at least in the Soviet interpretation of it, which of course is not new with Marxism, but that's another story. And capitalism is about private ownership, private initiatives, and market. There are libraries full. There are literally hundreds of thousands of studies on what makes the difference between them. Right? Okay. However, and each of the schools, each one of those ideological fronts has created sub-schools that fight in each other. You know, we have our Keynesians and our neoliberals, we have our Austrians and our classical and the capitalist model, and on the Soviet side you have Marx and English, Marx, Leninism and Trotskyist and Maoist and all that good stuff. And those people fight among each other and produce massive amount of studies of what's different between them. However, again, there's one thing, see, they fight each other, okay? And nicely internally. Now, the key thing is there's something in common which is never talked about. And guess what it is? It is the money system. The only difference between the Soviet system and the capitalist system was that the banks were owned by the government. But they used bank debt money with interest as everybody else. Same thing in China. So we have been blind ideologically by what is common between all the schools. That's the second level. Third one, academic taboo. How many of you have degrees in economics? Or okay. Had courses in economics? All right. Good. How many of you know about the Chartalist school? About what? Chartalist. About what? Chartalist. Interesting, isn't it? The Chartalist School exists in the 1920s. It's still active. 
is producing a lot of journals and articles and stuff which you never hear of and which will never find a mention in Samuelson or anybody else in any of the schools that we talked about. Why? They actually show that it is possible to have a monetary system that produces full employment and price stability, but at the condition you cross the wire, that the government issues the money. <laughs> taboo, taboo. Nobody talks about it. Okay? The guys are currently living in the University of Missouri of Kansas City, which is equivalent to what the Soviet system used for, I would say, Siberia. You send people there you never want to hear of again, and you make sure that they never can get a feedback to Obama or anybody else. Right? So, it is now possible, the full, full employment and no inflation. Academically, that school has not been challenged. And from what I study on it, they're right. Okay? Now, let me go a step further here. I don't agree with them for another reason, which I'll explain to you in a few minutes, which is the systemic nature. It does, what, what they really do is change the driver. Instead of Jason, they put, you know, Jack, right? The government, instead of the private sector, the same system. To me, that's still not the solution. Now, how many of you know the difference between the Nobel Prize of Economics and the other Nobels? Anybody? Yes? What is it? Oh, what's irregular about it? Oh! Oh! Gee! Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that is a sufficient answer. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Okay. Now, Paul Krigman told me personally that it was totally crazy to talk about the money issue. He said, have you not, we were both from MIT, okay? We were graduated in the same school. We had the same professors, right? And what he told me, didn't they tell you? Never touch the money system. Never touch the money system. You can touch everything else. Never touch the money system. And the reason is there. You will not be invited in the right places, and you can kiss goodbye on the Nobel on anything else that is worthwhile getting. You're killing yourself academically if you touch the money system. And the way it's enforced is, among others, to this Nobel game. That's just one example. It's true for all the other things. Okay? And it's done very cleverly. Because the reward for economics, every talks about the Nobel Prize of Economics, it doesn't exist. It is the price of the Rix, the Rixbank Prize for the in honor of Alfred Nobel. And it's paid for by the central bank and is decided by the board of the central bank. So this is literally the same thing as saying we'll put Microsoft or Bill Gates in charge of the future of computing. Right? You see the point? So you start seeing the, layer, the layers of blindness that we're creating here? Finally, the best lobbies are those that don't know whether they're lobbies. Whenever you talk about money, and I've talked in the European Union with some people in the European Union, what did they tell me? Go and ask the central banks. Of course, you cannot do anything in that domain without asking the central bank. They are the reference, right? Interestingly enough, I've been at the central bank. And let me confess something which I haven't talked publicly about yet. The reason I left the central bank was a conversation that I had with the Secretary General of the, United, of the Bank of International Settlements, which is the club of the central banks, where I was a delegate of Belgium. And they told me, literally, I had written a book on Latin America back in 1979, announcing the Latin American debt crisis, for those who remember this old history. It was, I believe, the only book that actually announced the crisis of the, of the Latin American debt. And he said, Bernard, I read your book. What are you doing in a central bank? And I told him the truth. Interestingly enough, in the Belgian central bank, they never asked me that question. Well, I would have told them too. I said, look, 
I believe that I just wish written a book on Latin America saying that this is going to be the first of a series of monetary crashes because this is a systemic issue. Okay? And thought that the most logical place would be in a central bank. So when you offered me the job, I came. But he said, but Bernard, you have to understand. We exist, the Bank of International Settlements. The central banks exist. The IMF, the World Bank exists only for one purpose. One purpose. To keep the system going as it is, not to improve it. It is the lobby for status quo. It was created in the 19th century because the deal that the banking system got at the time was the best they ever could get. So we now we're going to create an institutional framework that actually freezes that reality forever. Okay? So that's the last bit. There's an active lobby that nobody sees as a lobby, because it's different from the central banks, or different from the banks, right? Oh yes, that's a, you know, they actually fight with each other and they actually, you know, have disagreements about these things. But there's one thing they agree on, the status quo on the system. The car is a taboo. Okay? That's the message. Are we clear so far? So we can start seeing why we don't see. We've been trained not to see for a long time. Okay. Now let's go to the systemic cause. Uh, my colleague, Robert Dulanovic from the University of Maryland, has spent 25 years quantifying um, the flow of biomass in an ecosystem. Uh, you'll ask me immediately, what the hell does that do with money, right? I'll give you the answer. What basically, a, a, an ecosystem is a network. Right? Yeah, the sun, give plants, animals eat the plant, the plants, animals eat animals. We eat it all, and you know, we create an ecosystem that either is stable or not stable. And he found out that in such a network, which is a complex network, there is the systems that are stable, i.e., any ecosystem that's natural. They've been there for a few million years; otherwise, they wouldn't be stable, right? You have a balance between two things throughput efficiency and rebound capacity. Throughput efficiency is the, the quantity of stuff, biomass, that you go through in your system, and rebound capacity is the capacity to rebound, to survive, to adapt to changes in the environment or changes, diseases or whatever. Okay? Now, these are emergent properties from a network structure which is completely independent of what circulates in the network. It works for biomass in an ecosystem, it works for electrons in an electrical distribution system, it works for information in, a, in your immune system, or it works for money in an economy. They're all complex networks. You see the connection? So the structure itself is actually predetermining what is stable or not stable. Now, here is the graph. It's actually the matter well behaved. Here is you have diversity and interconnectivity, and there you have sustainability. We can now quantify for the first time with a unique metric, a single number, whether a complex system is sustainable or not. Okay? And the trade off is between two things. If you have uh, the optimum is there, if you go more, towards less diversity, you actually can increase your efficiency, but you will reduce your sustainability. But, and if you push too far, you go beyond the optimum, you will actually have stagnation. Things kind of sit there and nothing happens. There is no dynamic, there is no movement, there is no life formation. So that is what we know. Now, in all natural ecosystems, there is a window of vitality which is pretty narrow around these two, the, uh, around the optimum. Guess what? Our money system sits there, way out of the range. And the reason for it is the monopoly of a one type of money, of a one type of money in one type of institution. It's equivalent to say, all right, we have decided that the trees that are growing fast are pines. 
we eliminate all the pines on the planet and only plant pines. I'm predicting that is going to be a crashing world. I don't know why, it will be fire, it will be whatever, but something will happen that will not make that sustainable. We understand that in an ecological system, but we've been trained to believe that in the money domain, that is normal. That's the only way that to be right. So, it is predictable. I don't know which curve you're going to crash your car in, but you will not get in Italy. <laughs> okay? That is the point. And it doesn't matter what regulations you're going to introduce, you're going to, well, improve a little bit, you're going, you're going halfway up or halfway down, but the system is unstable. So, with the systemic cause of this nature, which, you know, is complete contradiction with the paradigm of a monopoly of a single currency of one type of institution, right, we're, we're stuck. We need to get beyond that. Actually, the big criticism when I talk about introducing other currencies than the conventional one, the immediate current, that anybody been trained in engineering or in economics is, it's less efficient. It's true. It is less efficient. But it is more resilient. That's the point. But we've been trained to think only in efficiency. It's the only variable we know, right? Yes. Your only objection is the diversity. Okay. Now we have to define who we're interconnecting with whom. I'm talking about the two billion people who live on one dollar, a dollar a day. Are they very interconnected in the economy of the world? I wouldn't say so. I don't think so. That's not what they think. <laughs> they have trouble surviving. No. It is getting money to the little roots at the end of your little distribution system. We have very good big channels. The, the, you know, the big banks are all interconnected. Sure, we have $3 trillion a day of foreign exchange transactions, 50 times bigger than all the economies and exports and imports. Sure, that's big canals, that's efficiency. It's not diversity. Anyway, let's not go into... The, if you follow me, let's go... I mean, uh, what I've asked you is let's not have a debate, because otherwise we'll never get to the conclusion, right? But. I'm just trying to make sure that, we, that I'm understood, all right? So, no, the diversity, all the banks, all the currencies in the world are bank debt money. We've seen that their interconnection makes them actually more vulnerable. But they're not connected with the real world, and the connection with a bulk of humanity is not there. The fact that we can say we have, we pay our farmers in Europe not to produce, and we have Africans starving, and we don't find a mechanism to link the two because there is no market. They don't have money. All right? That's not in the connection here. The market is defined as people who have a need plus money, right? There's no money, there's no market. It's artificial. Anyway. The systemic solution is to diversify our media of exchange. We're already doing this. We're already doing this. All of you have been using complementary currencies. Miles. Free and flyer miles. It's another currency unit, not created by banks without interest, which is a currency. It's actually a global currency. It's not marginal. There are 15 trillion miles out there, one and a half trillion out of every year. It's big, global systems, but you don't see it as money, <laughs> okay? Because it's kind of limited. Fine. Uh, Complementary currencies, I mean, I have a whole book on that, which I'm not going to bother you with, is complementary currencies, currencies that are working parallel with conventional money, are useful at all times for social issues, for economic issues, and all that stuff. Now, in a crisis environment, I believe it's going to be necessary. But it is violating our paradigm. So, what is my proposal? I'm going to only take one example of the, the whole range of families of complementary currency solutions that are existing. I'm going to take one that actually addresses uh, Mr. Ram Rasmussen's comment this morning. He said the biggest crisis that we're going to be expecting is now employment. And employment is directly related to 
small and medium-sized enterprises. Small and medium-sized enterprises are being starved. Why? Because it's starved. Why? Because it's unprofitable to, to deal with them for a bank. It costs the same amount of work to make a deal for 100,000 euros or 100 million euros. The amount of work is the same, but the profitability is down time bigger. So there is a structural issue there too. Why we can't really, it is not profitable to work with small and medium-sized businesses. We can solve that. Anyway, uh, the objective of it is to reduce un unemployment by actually providing working capital directly to the small and medium-sized enterprises as a work capital basis. Now, the problem typically is the following. You're a small company. When you buy something, you're going to have to be paid either cash or in 30 days. When you sell something to a bigger player, you're going to be paying 90 days. Okay? So as you try to grow, you automatically will get strangled. You go to the bank, and the bank says, I'm not interested in dealing with you. So that is the mechanism by why unemployment blows up. So what can we do about it? This is not a theory, what I'm presenting. It is operational in two countries right now, in Uruguay and in Brazil. Okay? But we're introducing it in Europe now. I am a small, medium-sized enterprise. I have sold to you, say the government, and you're going to be paying to me supposedly in 90 days. Okay? Fine. I can insure that invoice and pay my suppliers with the proceeds of it. Okay? That's it. It's very simple. Now, it is in fact a complementary currency. Okay? Because as long as you don't pay, I don't have the euros. But I can proceed with paying other things. What the other person can do, each recipient, let's assume that I, I sold you and you're one of my suppliers, I'm paying you with the proceeds of the insured invoice. You have two choices. You want dollars or you want euros? Fine, no problems. We have an agreement in our network with a bank. And you then can actually require dollars or euros, for example, to pay for your taxes okay? or your, your employees. Well, you do that, but you pay the 90 days interest and you pay the banking fees. Okay? Or you can pay him with no cost. That's the mechanism. It's a simple idea. Okay? Um, this is operational in Uruguay and Brazil, and Uruguay is now legally, and I'm emphasizing that, the government of Uruguay accepts the payments of that currency in payment for all taxes and fees, at, at par with conventional bank debt money. That is the solution to unemployment. We create a number of units of that on a regional level, decentralized, having standardized for uh, standardized uh, uh, inf uh, IT technology. The thing is op an open source. It's available. It works. Okay? And make them interconnect. So this is the way, the scheme of it. Okay? You see uh, the, cir the circuit goes on like this. You need an insurance company. You need a bank to get out. But as long as the money circulates in here, it actually doesn't deal with interest at all. And what they have done in Uruguay is accept that the payment also goes back to the government directly in that currency. That is the holy grail, by the way. That is why bank debt money keeps its monopoly. It is the payment of taxes, legal tender. OK. To uh, conclude, Bella, could, I, could I ask you to, to wrap up I'm very finished. briefly? And then I'm, we'll, okay. I'm, I'm done. I have two more slides. The first <laughs> one is we have a choice. Okay? Trying to make the old model work a little further while the burden is too big, or actually choose something different. And I would say that we have the complementary currency field is today in the same domain as microfinance or open source programming was 10 years ago. 95% of the people never heard of it. And if you heard of it, you dismiss it because it's irrelevant or, or marginal. Okay? So, re-regulation is necessary. I have no argument with it. However, I think we need to do better than in the 1930s. 
Such solutions were prohibited in the 1930s, were blocked in Austria and in Germany, and we know the political consequences and economic consequences in the long run of that. Fascism is direct connection with unemployment. So if you're going to have double unemployment, you're going to have a problem. So for those who are interested in following up, there are all the documentation about it is available on that website. Thank you. Well, not, uh, thank you very much. That gives us... Uh... Could you come up stage? Uh, we'll, we'll take uh, a comment from the three commentators, and then maybe, then maybe one or two more questions, and then, that, uh, then we go to the end of the day. Uh, but basically, what I understand from, from your reaction to Bernard's presentation, uh, we should not have a complementary currency simply because it's inspired by a conspiracy theory. Is, and is, is that basically what you're saying? Or maybe it addresses another, another question, but you know, I don't see how it addresses the question we're discussing okay. here. I, I, well, first of all, thank you for all the points of agreement, which is uh, a happy to take, uh, yeah. conclusion. Um, there's only one thing which I would say uh, as, as a clarification on that. Uh, what I've been talking about ecosystems is not just a parallel or a metaphor. We're talking of a mathematical, proven, scientific demonstration of what a network stability conditions are for any network independently of what you put in it. So, you know, the, the example with blackouts in electricity is very valid. And we've had that exactly for the same reason, because engineers have the same push towards efficiency. Okay? The reason for, monopoly for, in, uh, for a monopoly of conventional money in an economy has been efficiency because it creates efficiency for price formation and efficiency for exchange. The reason for introducing at the euro level was the same, was increasing the efficiency in the single market. Uh, the Milton Friedman's argument in 1955 for the, getting rid of all the regulations internationally was it would be more efficient. We've been pushing always in the same direction, is my point. Fine. Now, on the two points where you say we have disagreement, actually, I don't see the disagreement. Okay, let me just tell you why. Conspiracy theory. I have not talked about the conspiracy theory about the crisis. I have talked about the conspiracy theory about the paradigm of money. I.e., I say in the 19th century, the idea of central banks as an institution to keep a status quo in the monetary paradigm is a conspiracy. Okay? And I can prove it historically. Okay? and we have the evidence for the Federal Reserve and all that stuff very nicely done. It doesn't matter. I would say it was a logical thing to do. It was a clever thing to do. But that was a conspiracy theory. I have never said, and I'm actually convinced it is not true, that there would be a conspiracy that someone knew that this crisis was there and that you know, provoked it or maneuvered it or something like that. Everybody was surprised genuinely, I believe, including, you know, Greenspan to begin with. He said it publicly and lots of other people said it privately. So, no problems there. The conspiracy is not about the crisis. The conspiracy is about the money paradigm. That's what I'm talking about. And that's where the PR aspects and the aspects for, you know, the sophistication of actually dealing with that, instilling that paradigm and maintaining that paradigm is relevant. Um, could I ask you to, f to finish up your comments? Yes, and then we'll, well, have I'm, I'm going to address the, the second point. And then we okay? wrap up. Already. The second point is, when you say money has little to do with the crisis, I have to disagree. The reason that the banking system is relevant for money, because they have the monopoly to creating money. That's it. They have legally the monopoly to create money. And the, and the governments are enforcing that by insisting that only that currency created by bank debt money can be accepted in payment of taxes. That is the mechanism. Okay? So, when you say we have a financial crisis or we have a banking crisis, nothing to do with money, I'm sorry. The reason that the banks have been saved is because the governments were panicking because they know from the 1930s that when you don't save the banks, everything stops because nobody has money. So, there's direct connection. That's my view. That's where I disagree with your disagreements. <laughs> and where I believe we actually agree. 
Well, I, I don't, okay, I don't let, dispute that the, the reason for saving yeah. the banks is that, you know, the, the destroying the banking system is extremely costly because yes. you're... Yes, because but, of this function that money. And my suspicion is that but, we're going to learn now is that we can't afford course, it. I mean, they, what I don't understand is this monetary solution to a, to a problem which I don't see is, is the problem well, we're having. Me, I mean, you know, me, how would your, would your proposal address the problem we've had? Okay, I'm going to express to you, in the, not in theory, but in practice. How many of you know about the weir in Switzerland? Interesting, back to the blind spot. In 1934, 16 business people got together in Zurich and decided to run around the banking system by creating their own currency. One year equals one Swiss franc without interest. I sell you something, I have credit, you have debits. And then with my credits, I can buy other things. There are 75,000 businesses in Switzerland who have been using this for the last 75 years. There's a study done by a colleague of mine, Stodder, from Rensselaer University that demonstrates that the reason for the stability of the Swiss economy is not the chocolate, otherwise Belgium would be better, and it's not the cows or the air or the, or the mountains. It is the existence of that second currency, and let me explain how it works. Whenever there is a recession in Switzerland, the volume of wheat and the number of participants goes up. Whenever there is a boom in the Swiss economy, it goes back down again. Why? Very simple. If you give the choice to any Swiss business guy, of, I'm going to pay you 1,000 Swiss francs or 1,000 weir, he say, give me the 1,000 Swiss francs. With that, I can go anywhere in the world, I can do everything I want. With my weir, I have to spend it with the 75,000 people. So, however, if the discussion is, I'm not buying from you unless you accept weir, the conversation changes. And that's what happens in recessions. So, the Swiss economy is more stable than its neighbors, not because of the Swiss are nicer people. Okay, but does it mean that the, the Swiss could have afford to let um, uh, UBS go bust? No, so but where is what I'm saying that? is that the unemployment level in Switzerland is going to be less high, and the reason, well, the, the, the Swiss have another problem, which is, which is a but different you, issue. You're basically, uh, then it's the, 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 the response is that you, you want to insulate some parts of the economy from the meltdown, but the meltdown no. would, would still be there. Now, what I'm saying is, and actually I have said this in Zurich two weeks ago, if the Swiss went to deal with their structural issue, they accept the weir in payment of taxes, and you're going to suddenly have 75,000 businesses, you're going to have 750,000 businesses, and it's going to be represent not 2% of the GNP, but 20% of GNP. That's the difference. So, in other words, it is a systemic solution, okay, to automatically do this balancing fact, rather than what we are trying to do, which is forcing it down to banking system so that they can start lending again, which they will start doing 10 years from now when they're out of their hole. Okay, very interesting discussion, and maybe you should follow up in, so, in some papers. <laughs> I just want to take the reactions from the three commentators of us, Jason, Prestige Economics in Texas, yeah, I, and then I, uh, uh, Chris Hughes of Breaking Views, and then Rich Wilson, your editor of Barron's. So. Yeah, great. Uh, I, I, I really found this discussion of the, and, and the debate about the, the dual currencies very interesting. Um, I, I think uh, I have a couple questions about it. And the first is, uh, what would prevent an arbitrage in the global market of a, of a dual currency? So it doesn't matter if it's issued by a government, whoever issues it, what would prevent a hedge fund from going in? Now that, now that you've told us this about the Swiss franc, okay. the weir, what would prevent a hedge fund from going in, buying up all of the weir, because only 75,000 businesses use them, and then play with the Swiss franc? Uh, squeeze everybody out and then dump the weir back in the market. Okay. Um, and then uh, a, a couple other quick, a couple other right. quick questions. Capital controls. Um, and, 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 uh, one more. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the other one would be, what about uh, for dual systems? Is is Cuba an example uh, no. because they have both an internal and an external currency that's regulated by the government for use, or the dollar okay. that's used in a lot yeah. of other. Yeah. Can I ask you to hold economies. off on the answer, Chris? Can you? Share your reaction with us, yeah, I, I love a good conspiracy theory, so thank you for that. Um, it was a dazzling, dazzling and uh, a radical um, paper, which I very much enjoyed. Um, uh, in my, uh, what I took from this, I, I think it's, it's, it's good to hear this distinction between uh, you know, efficiency and stability, and I think that's a very important trade-off. Whether resilience. This is, sorry, um, resilience and, um, and efficiency, and um, uh, whether this is the right um, conclusion from that uh, from from that um, um, contrast, I'm not I'm not sure. Um, and also, I think it's great that we're thinking about what we can learn from complex systems. It seems to me that the financial system 
uh, is often treated as something that's sort of hermetically sealed and, it's, and, it, and, and, and operates in a very sort of scientific way and clearly it doesn't, not just it's internally complex but it's based in, you know, it's based in a social system as well which interacts with. Um, if I've got some concerns and questions, um, and just to echo Jean here, I'm not sure whether this is the right, um, whether a parallel currency would have um, prevented the financial crisis. Um, and, and I'm not clear where, where, where the confidence comes on from uh, in this currency. From uh, in this currency, you set me up as a potential um, supplier taking it, and my sort of initial mental reaction was, I'm swapping this into dollars right away. Um, so I'd like to know a bit more about where, where the where the confidence in this currency comes from, especially as a, um, you know, if, does it just end up becoming another sort of plaything of, of, of speculators in the end? So the same question he has. Yeah. Well, I found it uh, fascinating. Uh, it's the kind of thing one doesn't think about every day, to put it mildly. Um, I'm not sure that, you know, to compare, if you can really can compare the inputs into an electrical network or a biological network with that into a financial economic network. But regardless of that, the questions I have are kind of practical. Um, how much of the business in Brazil and Uruguay actually is done this way now? And two, you would obviously encounter a tremendous amount of political resistance to uh, a change like this. I mean, do you think that we'd have to have another, well obviously you think the crisis isn't over, do you think that would have to happen before we could even have a chance of getting something like this? Well, okay. keep it as brief as possible, but I realize there's a lot of questions. But All right, I'm going to try to veer, uh, arbitrage. The veer is uh, cooperative. Okay? It's cooperative between 75,000 business. You need to be accepted to get in. Your hedge fund, zero chance of getting in. Number two, it's not convertible into Swiss francs. If you have a debt in Veer franc, in Veer, you have to compensate for it in Veer. Okay? So the two systems are in equal value. The standard of value is the same, but they are not convertible into each other. And if you do convert it illegally, you're expulsed from the system, which is the worst punishment that the people went have. Okay, so that's, that's the answer to that. So no arbitrage, okay? Cuba, no. Cuba basically does two things. It has dollars and it has national currency. Well, that's not two systems. They're two identical systems. They're the two, they're two nephews of each other. They're bang that money in both cases. So it's not a parallel. Uruguay is a parallel, okay? So, which I'll get back to when, when I address the next question. Um, would the complementary currency save the system from a crash? No. I haven't said that. It would avoid to have the same effect that a banking system has on the rest of the economy. Okay? That would be the difference. I'm not claiming that it would solve the stability of the existing system. They could be still as stupid and do what they do now. That's fine. And it would have the same results. Okay? But you have another wheel. It's like an idea of a spare wheel is a stupid idea in a car, except if you have a flat on a Friday evening on a highway, right? Then it suddenly kind of makes a lot of sense to transport that boring thing which is not very efficient. That's what it is. It doesn't save you from having crashes, but it makes a difference when you do have one, okay? Uh, and Richard's comments, yeah. it, you say it's a comparison with an ecological network. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, it's not a comparison. It is the same network process. Just as what we talked about before with the electricity networks crashing, blackouts, is the network structure that actually creates the crash. It is an emerging property from the network, okay? whether it's stable or not. So it's not a parallel, it's not a metaphor, it's not a comparison. It is a demonstrable, quantifiable equivalence. Unless you tell me that the economy is somehow not a network, which is hard to prove. I mean, you know, definitely what happens in an, in a, in an economy is money circulating. Mm -hmm. GNP is the sum of all the circulations. Okay? So that's the, that part. How much business is done in Uruguay and Brazil? In the case of Brazil, they have decided to introduce this system on a local economy level. Okay? So they have not doing it on the national level. They are now implementing... But it's underway already. Yeah, they're in the way. <laughs> okay. 
they are currently 24, there used to be until about a year ago, one pilot study that's been going on for 10 years in Fortaleza in the northeastern Brazil called the Palma, Palma Bank, okay, which is in a favela. Okay? Now they're generalizing into 150 local dual currency banks. So the issue here is not the volume. The issue in the case of the Palma, it has proven to be create 3,200 jobs in which no jobs were ever created before. Okay? That's the difference. Okay? So that's, that's the Brazilian case. In Uruguay, the process is being implemented as we speak on the national level. It becomes operational in October, this month, on the national level. There have been pilot things, and everybody is participating, including electricity, water, you know, all the public utilities, plus the tax authorities. And it's done completely electronically. So I would be able to answer your question probably in two or three years' time. Okay, thank okay. you very much. Uh, I, I want to give one more word to the, the last final comment today of the speaker on stage before we go to Baltimore to speak to the cartoonist of The Economist, Jean-Pierre Ferry. Actually, two words. One is that the system you're describing uh, already exists on a world scale. That's uh, Asia vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the US and Europe. Asia has very little exposure, had very little exposure, financial exposure, to uh, the, um, the toxic uh, product. So essentially, Asia suffered through trade, which indicates that you, know, you can be isolated financially uh, through your, your, your parallel currency. You still suffer a lot through trade. And just assume now that uh, you know, uh, Asia would have lost the foreign exchange reserves. Um, the China would have lost a two trillion uh, dollars by, because you would have let the, the rest go bust. Uh, it would have been much more <laughs> significant. So I don't think that uh, this isolation works. I think we, I mean, the, 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 goal, the goal should not be isolation. Should, the goal should be should be. Who's stability. talking about isolation? I'm sorry. But that's the None of the 75,000 businesses in Switzerland are isolated. No, but that's, I mean. That's I mean, they're dealing with everybody else yeah, in that, the economy. They have a dual currency, that's all. Yeah, but that's, that's not that, an isolation. But that doesn't protect them. That, that, well, that, that it protect protects them. them more than not having it there. That's yeah, all. I mean, they, <laughs> yes, but more, more that, that, you know, if you have a major the source of instability in the system, you want to address this major source of instability instead of saying, you know, you can be, you know, in part isolated by because you, you trade among yourself in a different currency. Yes. Second, I, I think second point, I mean, the, very quickly, this trade-off between uh, um, stability or, or resilience and efficiency is major. It's, a, it's a one of the key issues mm -hmm. uh, you know, down the road, uh, key policy, policy choices. Uh, you know, we're raising capital uh, requirements. Uh, there are a number of things that we can do that can be done that results in, in, in increasing the cost of capital with consequences for growth, with consequences for efficiency, and some positive effect on stability. And this trade-off has to be addressed explicitly because that's the core choice. I mean, do we want to protect ourselves for whatever uh, crisis that can occur in the next 50 years, but at what price? Okay, I want to leave it at that. I'm sure it's not going to be the last word in this discussion. I think it's fascinating to hear about this concept of a complementary uh, uh, currency. I want to thank you as well for, uh, for commenting on this. Uh, a big round of applause for the two speakers.